Okay, so um, I'm ready to go. Is that okay, Nima? Shall I, shall uh, I start? Yes, yeah, just, um, just How's the sound? To is... that up, I kind of everything. Are you hearing me all right? We can hear you, Sarah, yeah. Great, lovely. Okay, well, thank you very much to Agile for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here today, as you say, so close to World Osteoporosis Day, um, to talk to you about physical activity and exercise for osteoporosis and bone health. Um, uh, my name is Sarah Leyland. I work with the Royal Osteoporosis Society. I have done for many years. I'm a specialist nurse by background, um, and I work now as a clinical advisor across a whole range of projects at the charity. Um, I'm really going to talk to you mainly about some new information resources that we have produced at the charity this year, which I hope you'll find useful. Um, for your, as you say, for your clients and patients. Um, but I think there may be something there interesting for yourselves as well. So um, I'm going to introduce those to you. So I'm going to uh, spend the next uh, 20 minutes or so um, taking you through um, the presentation, but hopefully leaving some time at the end for quest questions. So do uh, drop your questions into the chat, or I think if you like to speak out and ask your question, then I think that's a possibility as well. So we'll, we'll leave time for that. So the aims really of the session for me are um, really as a bit of a revision, uh, an update around the role of exercise and physical activity for osteoporosis and bone health. And I'm going to take you back and remind you of a consensus statement that I was very involved um, in producing with others back in 2018, but also take you through some other projects that we've been involved with and perhaps um, summarising some of the key messages that have come out over the last few years around exercise and uh, osteoporosis but particularly I'm going to um, remind you of the of the old suite of public resources that we have still available on our website and in some printed format and the new suite that I particularly wanted to tell you about and perhaps touch on some future projects that we at the charity are doing so that's what we're going to aim to do um, just a little bit of background first really just for your interest um, can you see that actually? I'm just wondering, I've got a little bit of a, 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 um, a line across the top of my screen. Can you see that? Have you got a, um, a black bar? I didn't want to. Have you got a black bar at the top of your, your screen? Or can see you it, see Sarah. it? We can see it, yeah. You can see what I'm... You can just close it, Sarah. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Can I close that bar, that task yeah, you, bar? Yeah, you can, yeah. <laughs> working out how to do that. Sorry, I'm not so familiar with Zoom. Um, just trying to take that little black bar away. Uh, I don't know how to remove it, sorry. <laughs> if anybody's got any ideas about how I can take the black bar off the top, but anyway, I think you can see most of the screen. So um, background really is um, exercise and osteoporosis. Now, back a number of years ago, we were reviewing our um, information resources. We had a booklet, some of you may remember, and we were really aware that uh, despite all the, well, certainly the years I've been working in the field, there still was a lot of uncertainty about really how effective exercise could be for bone health and osteoporosis and also quite a lot of questions around what was safe there was a lot of confusion around really what you couldn't couldn't do with osteoporosis and out of that we were finding and we did do a big questionnaire that there was a lot of fear amongst people with a diagnosis of osteoporosis and many of them were actually doing a lot less in terms of physical activity once they were told they had osteoporosis than they had been doing before so we set out um to really try and tackle some of these issues. And I was very aware that before we produced new information, we needed to go really right back to the beginning and try and get the experts in the field to give us some clarity on some of these topics. So out of that, um, quite a big piece of work it turned out to be in the end. I worked um, with experts in the field and we produced um, a statement, many of you will be aware, it was it, the themes that we, we focused on were strong, steady and straight. And this was a consensus statement 
on exercise and osteoporosis. Um, and we also out of that then produced some films and fact sheets for patients, for the public. Um, and these really were very um, popular. And then far following that in the last year or so, we had a bit of funding left over and I was asked to lead on a second piece of work, which was to fill in the gaps and to produce more information, particularly um, on how to build up the intensity of exercise for bone health. So those were the big chunks of uh, project work that I led on and, um, and really out of that has come much of the work we've done since. Now, again, just reminding you this, the themes that we came up with out of that work were strong, steady and straight. And really what that was saying was that there were three main ways that we thought exercise was very useful in the osteoporosis field. Firstly, to help promote um, strong bones, and that was through weight bearing and muscle resistance exercise. Secondly, that um, improving balance and muscle strength had an important role to play, as you will all know, and I'm sure have been saying for many, many years, uh, was an important one in terms of reducing falls risk, and that that was an important aspect in terms of preventing or reducing the risk of fractures. But then finally, there was a third theme, which was that exercise maybe had a role that we weren't recognising so much in terms of helping people to improve function and pain and symptom after vertebral fractures. And also there were quite a lot of messages and information that people wanted around the safety for their backs in terms of uh, moving, lifting, um, so safe moving and lifting really that would reduce the risk of vertebral fracture. So strong, steady, straight were the three themes that we came out with. And this, just to remind you, uh, was the strong, steady, straight consensus statement, quite a detailed statement. And we, I worked with certainly with some physios and other um, practitioners, but also with academics in the field to um, look at the evidence, look at the existing guidance and to come up with a statement. And we produced um, a quite, quite a nice quick guide to summarize everything within that. And just to remind you that they are still available uh, for download from our website. If you didn't ever get hold of them, I think they're still really useful source documents. And then we went on um, to produce other things too. But just I think perhaps it's worth just mentioning that I, I think the, the key themes that came out of that work are still worth uh, bringing to mind. So I'm just going to jot down what I think some of the key messages were. What we were saying was that exercise does have a role in terms of bone strength, but we just needed to be very clear that it complements rather than replaces the pharmacological treatments. So though there are many people who would love to think that exercise could be used as a replacement for the medications, the actual evidence is not huge in terms of reducing fracture risk. Um, however, there are some quite exciting new pieces of work and research that are going on. Some of you may have heard of the LIFMORE study, which is going on in Australia, where they are really putting people with osteoporosis through quite intense exercise programs and they are beginning to show some quite interesting improvements certainly in bone density but we don't have the fracture data so we use the word promote very much in the statement so we didn't talk about improving bone strength we we thought promote was quite a useful word because it was trying to say what would optimize bone strength without promising too much the other thing that we really came out with was we need to be positive and encouraging. We need to have a how to rather than a don't do approach, because many people were really thinking that once they got osteoporosis, it was don't do this, don't do this, avoid that. And that out of that, people were getting very anxious and were doing less. And also that enjoyment was key and that we needed to help people find exercise that they would enjoy. What was interesting was that um, the the bits of research we did, and we did commission some uh, research during the project, really seemed to show that broadly speaking, there was not a lot of evidence that exercise broadly increased the risk of fracture, um, that, that broadly speaking, the benefits seemed to outweigh the harms, and that there were not any absolutes in terms of what you couldn't do in terms of not bending forward or not lifting. So although it was important to be safe, there was no sort of absolute contradiction there, which I think was a new point. And the other really important thing was that actually 
moderate impact. And we, we went on to describe what that was in some detail. So um, a little bit more than the sort of uh, low impact. Um, we were talking about low level jumping and jogging and putting a little bit more force plus progressive mus muscle resistance exercise seemed to be the best types of exercise for bone strength. And that many of those with osteoporosis could be aiming for that. We did put in a little bit of caution around those who were very much in the potentially weaker group in terms of their bone strength. And so we did talk about some caution for those who've had spinal or multiple fragility fractures. But broadly speaking, many of those with osteoporosis could be aiming for moderate impact plus increasing muscle resistance exercise. So that was an important message. The other thing that came out was that we really needed to be there for people who had had painful spine, spinal fractures. We had some quite sad stories from some of the focus group work we did that people needed prompt and practical advice about moving and lifting and sad stories. I'm sure you all know this about people who waited weeks and weeks and weeks to see a physio and they didn't dare move at all because they couldn't get the appointment and they were frightened that they shouldn't, they really shouldn't be doing things. So prompt and practical advice was something we were aware of. So we then went on after that, that to produce, and many of you will have seen these, a whole range of um, videos and exercise um, fact sheets uh, which people could download or they could order single copies from us on a whole range of, of topic areas. And I won't go through those in detail because these aren't new. These were a few years ago and I'm hoping you've probably seen them or you're aware of them. And just for interest, we did do a bit of foundation work for the future. And we haven't really moved into the wider prevention field yet in terms of bone health for the whole population. But just for your interest, we did do a piece with Public Health England, looking very much at the evidence around what's the best type of exercise for bone strength in the young and when's the right moment to intervene. And there was nothing particularly new in that. I think that many of you won't know was that it was, you know, there was a kind of time pre-adolescence pre when doing a whole range of impact and muscle strengthening type varied exercise seemed to be the best. And this was some useful work for us to hopefully in the future base some broader bone health prevention work on. And then just for your interest, following on from lockdown, so that all happened way back in the dim and distant past. And since then, um, in the last couple of years, some really exciting follow on work. Um, and I worked with Catherine Brooke Wavell at Loughborough University and the group who had developed the statement. And Catherine took it forward as a published, took the consensus statement forward, forward to publication. And it was published um, uh, in the British Journal of Sports Medicine and they promoted it and it got fantastic coverage in the broadsheet papers in The Guardian and The Times and was actually one of the most talked about stories on Twitter in the sports science field and so we were very excited about that because I think you can do any work you like but if it's not if you can't reference it then I think that limits its its kind of uh, certainly in the academic field and the way people use it. So that was that was all exciting. Um, what I felt was important work to promote um, and to disseminate. So that's that's where we were. And now bringing you forward to the last couple of so last year and this year. And out of the big evaluation that we did, asking people what they wanted to know, we thought we needed to focus a little bit on the strong um, theme um, because that was perhaps one where we had a bit more to add. Um, and um, these were the plans we initially had. We felt we needed more for the fit and the able because that was the feedback we were getting was that a lot of our information was aimed more at the frailer end or for people who were able to do less. And there was a group who wanted us to be more motivational and um, provide something for the, the slightly more fit and able. Um, and they wanted us to build on a bit more detail. We really felt people still didn't quite understand about this weight bearing impact type exercise and this how to build up to moderate impact. And also there was a bit of confusion around what do we mean by progressive muscle resistance? How can we advise our, how can we learn or how advise from professionals? How can we advise our patients or clients about how to build that into their, into their daily lives for bones? And there was also still quite a lot of questions around safety that we felt we needed to tackle. There was a request from healthcare professionals to go back and produce some sort of summary resource, something a bit like the quick guide that people could give to their patients. And um, so that was something we, we were thinking about. And then there was a whole bit of work around accessing all the information on our website and putting it, integrating it all together and making it a bit more accessible. So this is what we produced. Um, 
I don't know if any of you saw it, but um, one of the exciting pieces of work that I did was to work with Scottish Ballet. So Scottish Ballet are a fantastic company. I don't know if you, any of you saw any of the work that came out during lockdown, but they've done amazing work. They've got a health team who produce information you know, directly for different health conditions. And they've done a lot of work around dementia and multiple sclerosis, but they were really, although it wasn't part of their plan for the year, they 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 really lent us uh, one of their choreographers and one of their health team, Tiffany Stott, and I worked with her and Catherine Book Wavell, and she produced um, a a dance for your bones, uh, so a an instructional twenty minute film. Um, teaching people how to do a four minute dance, which very much was um, incorporating the weight bearing impact type exercise that we talked about. And um, we've got a, um, in fact, if I've got time, I might just play you a little bit of a, have I got time just to play you a kind of quick, um, I'm not sure if this is gonna work, but just a taste of what it was like, um, just for those of you who might be interested. Actually, I didn't say I've got this, um, can I just, can I just move that across and see if you can hear it? Um. Can you hear that? So this was just to give you a little bit of a taste of the Dance for Your Bones, which we did. Um, and the film, this was just a promotional piece. The film actually is divided into six sections and you can learn a section at a time and then put it all together. So it was a sort of creative um, promotional piece about the dance. Okay. So there we go. I just thought that would be a, a taster for you just to see what it is. Um, and we've had um, some nice feedback on that from our audiences. Um, I'm just gonna... It won't want me to move on. Okay, so anyway, just to say that the dance was uh, very popular and we've had a lot of feedback from our support groups who've been trying it out. So that there's a resource for you if you're interested. So the other piece of work that we did, which I think is gonna be perhaps more relevant for yourselves, was to produce 11 short films teaching people how to build up that weight bearing and impact type exercise to promote bone strength and to also uh, produce a small safety film that incorporates all the questions people ask us. So that this was a big piece of work because initially when I set out to do it, I thought, well, <clears throat> it's all out there. We just need to put it into, into films. And uh, then I realized actually, no, we didn't really have the resources ready to put into these films. So I went back um, to Loughborough University and spoke to Catherine Brooke Wavell. She spoke to one of her colleagues who's a strength and conditioning coach and expert in the field, Richard Blaygrove. And then I worked with the two of them to uh, develop these this range of films. And it was quite a, a large piece of work, but I think in the end quite successful. So what did we produce? We produced um, four films on how to build up impact exercise for your bones. Um, these are all available, as I say, on our website. So if you're interested, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go through in a huge amount of detail, but I do encourage you to have a look. So the first film is very much an introduction explaining about what we mean by weight bearing impact exercise and really where to start and who, you know, what are the restrictions if you've got osteoporosis, not a lot. Um, but, but if you have got, if you are someone who's had spinal fractures or um, you've got multiple fractures, or indeed you're an older person who's really not able to build, you know, it's not, not capable and don't feel it's appropriate for you, um, then you might want to stick with a low impact exercise. But for those who are able and it fits with their general wellness, then they could build up to moderate impact. So we had <clears throat> the introduction and then one film on low impact, the second on moderate impact, and the third on how to build up to more advanced moderate impact. <clears throat> Excuse me. Many of you may recognise Bex Townley, who is very um, active, as you all know, in the uh, moving movement field and a strength and conditioning postural stability expert. And she teaches um, and presents, I think, really well in these films. So I would encourage you to have a look at those. And then, and, and these were the kind of, just as a summary, these were the three stages. So there were three exercises in the low impact group, three in the moderate impact, and then five in the more advanced. And then none of them are 
um, we're not giving lots of incredibly new information on this one, but we are kind of trying to encourage those who, who really feel they need a bit more confidence and a bit more encouragement to, to sort of gradually build up if that's right for them. So for some of those with osteoporosis who were not not already doing uh, this type of this type of exercise, it was really an opportunity to um, learn some instruction and feel more confident to build up. So that was the first group. And then the second group. Um, so this was the work that Richard Blaygrove did. Um, and this was all about how to build up muscle strengthening exercise, what we commonly think of as progressive muscle resistance exercise, and how to do that for your bones. and. And, and this program really came out of some very early discussions that I had with someone called Laura Giangorio, who some of you may know, who works out of Canada. She produced a huge program of exercise in Canada called Too Fit to, to Fracture. Um, and um, she felt that she was very much promoting the idea that, that really we need to encourage people to do one exercise from each of the four groups when we're looking at progressive muscle resistance. And the four groups were hinge, push, pull and squat. And for those of you who are familiar with progressive muscle resistance, then none of this is going to be completely new, but we were trying to look at a simple way of helping people who were aiming to improve their bone strength to sort of to build some regular uh, regular exercise into their day. So the plan of the programme, again, there's an introduction film first, is at each stage to choose one exercise from hinge, one from push, one from pull and one from squat. And then there were some fitness exercises, brace, lunge and step to help people uh, build up the function to be able to do the, the other exercises. And Richard put these into three groups, stage one, stage two and stage three, encouraging people to work at stage one for around a month to six weeks. And then if they were able and comfortable to move on to stage two and on to stage three. Now, these films are very much about principles and some of them are very much and there's this clear information here saying that some of them are really not something you would would be wanting to do on your own so they perhaps are more aimed at people who having got the principles in place might want to go to a gym see an exercise instructor and make sure they're doing them safely and carefully so there was no suggestion that people should rush out and do all sorts of um, high intensity muscle resistance without any instruction but it was really to explain the principles um, and these were just for your interest these were the the exercises that Richard put into the group. So for instance, stage one, you'd be doing the bridge from the hinge group um, and you'd be doing the wall press for the push and the band assisted row for the pull and the sit to stand for the, for the squat. And again, you'll be recognizing some of these exercises certainly in the, in the, in the, balance, in the steady field in terms of balance and, and, and false prevention. But here we're looking at using these exercises in terms of muscle resistance and increasing intensity in order to promote bone strength. So this is where you can see there is a progression at stage two, you're doing a very similar exercise, but it's a more intense exercise. So we're doing the band assisted Romanian deadlift, the press up, the single arm band assisted row and the hands free squat. And then at stage three, it's taking it on a stage further. Um, and, it, and depending on which stage um, people are at, they may be using bands, they may be using in a gym situation, they may be using um, barbells, kettlebells, weights. Uh, so there is a progression there. And then he talked, take, talks you through these functional exercises to, and again, building them up according to the stages. So a brace, um, a lunge and a step and taking people through the different stages in order to increase the intensity. So not a lot of brand new information, but quite a new way of targeted, targeting it at people looking to build up their bone strength and helping them to do, do it in a sort of progressive way. And actually, we've had some great feedback. I thought this was just quite interesting. This was an email that we had very soon after we launched the exercise films, uh, someone saying that she was really impressed. She found the new films extremely helpful. She liked the way they were fit, split into the stages and the benefits were explained. And we also, I should say, had a couple of films on how to use, very basic films on how to use resistance bands and how to use weights. So for people who wanted to start at the very beginning, there was some basic information there. <clears throat> and this woman said, when I was diagnosed with osteoporosis, I was only 50. I was struggling to find exercise that was appropriate. I'm, I'm generally fit and active. I haven't broken anything. I'm not frail. These are what I've been looking for and I started to use them regularly. So that was kind of great feedback and we're continuing to monitor feedback certainly from our website at the moment. 
Oh, yeah, that little bit more feedback. I was telling about the dance. I thought you might be amused by this. This was the Tiffany Stott, the dance, um, the dancer from Scottish Ballet. She came to our staff day and she taught the dance to a group of the staff, which was great fun. Um, and uh, I think they found it quite challenging, which is good. We wanted it to be challenging. And this is the um, an, a, quite a nice little uh, post on, on Facebook of the Sheffield support group doing the dance. So I thought that was just a bit of feedback on, on the work we've been doing. And just to say that wasn't the end of the work we did, we still are working on some other resources. So the company we work with, we also produced 43 single animations. So we took all the exercises, all the activities that you could take up that actually allowed you to do those exercises. And we produced animations to show what we meant. So the plan and some of those we've put into short films as well. And so the plan is to use all of these to enrich our exercise information on the website. So particularly for people perhaps who don't have, who have perhaps lower health literacy, who don't want to read a lot of text, who want to kind of see what we're talking about. So I think that's going to be a really exciting suite when we've completed it. And then just to say, uh, in terms of the tool for healthcare pro professionals, so not so much the detail, but the kind of hold in the hand summary guide, we've also been working on, on that. And this We've got the first draft, so it's going to hopefully be something which initially you download, but if there's an appetite for it, maybe we might produce some printed resources. So they could be something which the whole idea might be that as a professional, you would be able to use them if you wanted to with a patient or a client and sort of tick. This is the theme that I think you want to focus on. These are the kind of the particular groups of exercise you might be interested in and then signpost posting people back to what's on our on our website. But I think probably important to remember that a lot of this is not to in any way replace or to substitute for all the information that I'm sure all of you are using in your in your own professional practice, but really to try and fill in some of the gaps. Um, I would say that the whole steady story, and I'm not just saying this because I'm talking to you, but I think the exercise, development of exercise and support around exercise for balance and, and, and muscle strength and coordination and reducing falls is kind of very well developed. And I think that's going well, I would say. Well, I'm, you can put me right on that. But I think there are other gaps in terms of people looking to promote events who perhaps are not quite so frail who want to kind of um, follow up some of these avenues so hopefully we're filling in the the gaps um, there um, and just to say that I I then went on to our conference which was back a while some of you may have been there um, to showcase these new exercise plans um, and just for those of you who are interested um, I don't think I've got the link here but I can certainly send it on after we've got a really nice um we call it Bone Matters. It's a series of, of, of conversations with experts in the field on our website. And I did an interview with Richard and Catherine talking about the development of those and really going into the detail on why and what they put into those exercise films. So if any of you want to do a little bit more exploring of that, I would really recommend that discussion because I think it's, you know, a lot of health professionals have said it's been really useful for them. So if you'd like to take this further and find out more, I would recommend that and we can send you the link. So that's it really. That's kind of really a bit of a whistle stop tour through what we've done at the ROS, some of the new resources we've got and reminding you of some of the principles that came out of our early work. Um, this is the point I always hate when I'm doing something remote because I can't see you all and I don't know who's out there, but I'm hoping there may be some questions um, and I'm really happy to discuss any aspect. So I'll just stop sharing at that point. Um, and yeah, love to hear any feedback questions either through the chat. I think they're going to be fed maybe towards me. Um, or if you want to speak, that's even nicer. Thank you, Sarah. There's, there are no questions that I can see in the chat. Um, so if anybody wants to ask anything, please feel free to unmute. Or if any of you want to, if any of you want to... I know. Um, I think I can make a comment, Sarah, while you wait for some questions. <laughs> and uh, I do use a lot of ROS resources, literally left, right, and center through. Um, and in terms of the strong, steady, and straight, I do have like the the summary sheet that I print, which doesn't come out as well. But it would be great to have it as a leaflet, which would be much more vibrant and for people to kind of clear through. Um, and I in think terms we of exercises as well. That's something. 
And we're hoping to use some of the images. So the new images that we've got would be on that summary leaflet so that hopefully you could kind of, if you had a, someone in front of you who really you felt should just focus on some of the balance stuff, you could kind of tick that. If you felt they were worrying about, if there was someone with osteoporosis worrying about their Pilates or their bending forward or their whatever, then you could sort of tick other sections. So the whole idea is to sort of use it as a bit of a sign poster, really. So uh, Anything that anybody's Definitely. found surprising or yes. feels uncomfortable with or um, anybody who feels they've shifted in their views at all on exercise for osteoporosis or oh, a hundred year old lady with no, vertebral I just fractures. A question. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm Sarah. I'm one of the physios from Leeds Community Healthcare. Um, I was just wondering about the 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 circles, the straight aspect of the the objectives. Yeah. Does that ever kind of um, promote any fear in in patients regarding moving and bending is is the message behind that received well by patients or because I don't I don't tend to go into that too much I suppose with regard yes to... I think um I think that aspect came out because we some of the so there was quite a lot of questions around impact can I do it can I not am I going to break a bone which we tackled in the strong bit but there were quite a lot of questions we had a lot of interest from the we still do from the Pilates world I'm sure you hear about it too where there were people doing things like roll downs and loaded um flexion so they maybe were lifting up their legs and moving and there was a lot of questions about is it safe or not and i think the j the main message was we can't really be sure on this one but we certainly shouldn't have a cut off so as soon as someone's got a minus 2.5 you say they can't do this and they can't do that but we did say the broad principle was if you are move it's absolutely fine to bend forward and to incorporate that but really doing really sustained uncontrolled you know holding you know where if I was to try and really 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 try and touch my toes it's not something I can do and it would put a lot of strain on my back so it kind of gives you alternatives about how you could slightly amend or moderate to sort of reduce that forward flexion you know hinge from the hip that's absolutely fine but try not to do lots of kind of forcing your back into a touch your toes type position is the sort of message but on top of that we were also saying don't be fearful you can twist you can bend you can you can do all these things but just um do them in a controlled way and work within your comfort area and there is a bit and if you watch the pilates the pilates film we made with body control pilates and really what she is suggesting is do we really need to do the full roll down you know if you've got someone who's got um who wants to care for their back and he's not really comfortable with that well perhaps moderate it a bit you know don't go all the way down you know go do it against the wall support your back just go how far you're comfortable there's no absolute need to be pushing your spine into those kind of positions so that was kind of the focus and then the other side of it was about post vertebral fracture and really encouraging people to be able to do some muscle strengthening exercise which I'm sure you do anyway to strengthen that you know to strengthen the, the the muscles around their spine to support their spine and help reduce some of the muscle spasm so there is there was a focus on that thank you any other questions that comment in the chat Sarah? oh there was something about 100 year i sorry i haven't seen that one yeah yet. just um she's got a 100 year old lady with l2 vertebral fracture we are walking with a roll later, but would like to commence more exercises later. Any resource for this? That's what, I mean, I'm sure as you'd know, it, you know, it, it's not so much chronological, is it really? It's about how much people can actually manage. And I think it's all about gradually doing what you can. So if I was Dawn Skelton, I'd be saying, you know, the first point is don't, don't sit down for too long. You know, you'd obviously start at that point and then you'd build up gradually. So some of the gentle impact exercises are in, in the stage one are, 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 are the things that you do anyway, I'm sure, which are, you know, um, uh, you know, marching gently on the spot or, you know, that they're, 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 and I think looking at each of these and seeing which might be appropriate, it could be useful. I mean, it's just, a, it's a graded thing and it's going to depend on the individual. I think for many older people anyway, and I'm sure you, you know, you're all working in this field, um, 
you are going to be working more at the steady section. You know, you are going to be working at muscle strengthening and balance and um, the impact exercise is going to be low impact and um, whatever that person can manage. And that, and walking is going to be better than, you know, standing is better than sitting and walking is better than standing, but you're going to just have to take that gradually, aren't you? It's just thinking of the principles, I think, using muscle trying to have some weight pulling through. And if you are able to get a little impact behind that, then that's all the better. But it's going to become more difficult as we get older and frailer, as I'm sure you all know very well. Lovely, thank you. Somebody's just commented, the hinging I find difficult to teach with people who have painful knees as they don't yes. like the drift back. Any suggestions? Yes, I think it's an interesting one. I think this whole knee thing, we had quite a lot of questions at the conference to Richard about, you know, well, you're saying all this stuff about impact and, you know, really, if you've got bad knees. So so he was talking about the need to build, gradually build up. Um, yes, interesting. I mean, I think the principle of the of the hinge from the hip and the, you know, a little bit of a dip of the knee, is it, it's really just saying don't don't just bend your back when you're doing things you know do a little bit of a dip if you're and if we talk if you're going out of the washing machine you know don't sort of bend 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 so that you're really putting the stone on the back but just try a little bit to 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 just flex the knees a little and keep keep if you can I mean I certainly have been trying it I've been trying to build it into my general moving because it's quite easy to not do things like that isn't it it's quite easy to just move awkwardly but I find that if I but it's going to depend of course on how flexible you are and there's going to be some people for whom that isn't that isn't possible I, I appreciate that yeah okay, thank you we've got a question from Val how many physiotherapists does the Royal Osteoporosis Society employ to help with exercise advice we don't employ any physios and we have over the years thought about should we have physios um to support us on our helpline but we we don't I would say that probably because actually the majority of the questions we get asked a lot of the information we get asked is around drug treatments for osteoporosis that's probably the biggest thing we get asked also I think um we get a lot of advice you know so all of the information we develop we are working closely with with physios and others in the field so we would never do anything on our own I mean all this work that I did was really me saying what I wanted and um, it was the ex so, so when we produced the consensus statement we had a working group and we also had a, a steering group and the steering group was more academics and clinicians medics but the uh, working group was very much mainly physios and um the strength and conditioning thing was really interesting. I don't know what you feel about this, but certainly one of the physios I work with mainly felt that she was the one who brought in the strength and conditioning coach expert because she said that wasn't an area that she felt she knew a lot about. She felt as a physio that was not her expertise. So we we did bring in that um, that side of things. So, so we get a lot of support, but we don't employ anyone individually. No, we don't have any employed on our helpline or in our information team. Okay, thank you. I think that might be the end of the question, Sarah. Okay. Yeah, well, thank, thank you, you for listening. Um, and uh, anything else you'd like or any um, further resources, really happy to help. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Just to kind of mind everyone for the World Osteoporosis Day. I know some of you said we don't have any formal ideas. It might just be an email or a Twitter or whatever to your clients, to your colleagues to say about bone health and maybe just attaching the, you know, how healthy living uh, leaflet from the Royal Osteoporosis Society. It could be as simple as that. Just to kind and of could I, could I mention one other thing? Um, you may all know this, but we're focusing very much on, and great, thank you so much for raising awareness about osteoporosis, but I was just going to say we are really encouraging people to go on our website and fill in our risk checker. I don't know if you know about our, uh, we have an online risk checker. We've had about 200,000 people uh, fill it in since we launched it last year, and we're really encouraging you to share it with family and friends. So I think that's something Thing to to perhaps raise awareness of and we've got lots of information on our channels about it too so yeah, that that might be the link to send the email or yes 
that might yes, be the link to send by email. <laughs> it's a very nice. <laughs> it's a nice quiz. Clients. It yeah. takes five it's minutes to, to fill in. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me, and uh, I'll see you. See you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. bye. Guys, we are moving swiftly to, to Dr. Kasim's presentation. He is not here on person, but his recording is with us. Um, he actually send it through transit. So, Luis, are you okay to? I'm just trying to find. Hello, my name is Kasim Javed, and I'm really sorry I can't be with you live today, but for travel reasons, I am not able to join online. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak to you about fracture risk assessment, especially the FRAX tool. Here are my declarations. So I'm going to discuss a little bit about why fracture risk matters, the FRAX tool, strength and limitations, and how you can think about and incorporate the secondary prevention setting. So why does it matter? Well, initially, the diagnosis of osteoporosis was pretty much yes or no. We identified people using a bone density scan that was low enough to be uh, di diagnosed as osteoporosis, and then these people were then started on treatment. Our thinking of osteoporosis has changed. We now think of risk of fracture, and this has changed how we assess people for bone fragility. So we're now using a much more quantitative approach where we scale people's risk of frac, move away from the yes, no, do you have osteoporosis? And this has really been led by the team in Sheffield who've created the FRAX tool. And what they did, bring together the evidence base from lots of cohort studies, a lot of work, uh, and looked at if you had this risk factor, how did it increase fracture risk? And when you put them all together, can we come up with a number? So the FRAX website has changed. It's now the FRAX Plus website, and you can find it here. And this is what you'll see when you come to it. And the first thing you need to do is you need to put in your co continent and your country. Once you've done that, you have to put in the patient level data. And it's divided into 11 questions that you can ask the patient. And the last question uses bone density. The more questions you can answer, the better, because these all contribute to risk. The big hitters are sex, body mass index, age, and then of these risk factors, previous fracture and parental history of hip fracture. So what do these mean in more detail? Well, the FRAX website is brilliant. It's got a lot of information about all these risk factors. So for example, previous fracture is any fragility fracture in adulthood that would be the result of a fall from standing height or less. And just be careful about vertebral fractures, nearly always underdiagnosed by both patients and their doctors. For parental history of hip fracture, be careful. Some patients get confused between hip fracture surgery and surgery for osteoarthritis. And the best way to differentiate this is to say, was this an emergency operation or was it planned? Steroids are oral steroids of more than five milligrams a day for more than three months at any time. And there's a list of secondary causes of osteoporosis. If you do have a bone density scan, then you need to put in the machine and the number for the femoral neck. You can't put in scores from other areas. And if you know that your results are based on the female reference range, you can just put in the T-score. So once you do all of that, you will then get a, a, a 10 year probability of fracture. So here it's 30% for major and 6.7% for hip. And as a rule of thumb, anything over 20% for major and 3% for hip is worthy of consideration of treatment. In the UK, we have the NOG guidelines, which really take this to another level. And here you can see if you press that button, it'll open a new website, and that will show you if the patient has a, a risk of fracture where you just give lifestyle, 
where it's recommended to measure bone density, where you can treat, or where actually their risk of fracture is so high they need to be referred for specialist uh, review because they may be eligible for treatments that hospitals can give, not usually available in primary care. And these are injectable, what we call anabolic drugs. The NOG guideline is a fantastic resource you can look at that gives you lots of information about osteoporosis, it's got guidelines and a real wealth of information. There are some limitations to FRACs. So the major one is which bone, how many were broken and how long ago. Also, how much steroid are people having and other key uh, secondary causes of osteoporosis such as diabetes, myeloma and MGUS, some causes as cancer therapies and then another important cause of fractures, falls risk. So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on talking about recency of fracture. We used to think that a previous fracture increased your risk of another fracture in a linear way. We now know that if someone has a recent major fracture, they are at very high risk of another fracture in the next two years. And we call this the imminent risk of fracture. And these patients are important because they need rapid assessment and rapid treatment, both with medicines and also falls reduction. And here you can see it uh, operationalized as the imminent fracture risk period. So this is a very important concept. If you do see people in your practice who've had a recent fracture, they are usually at high imminent risk of fracture and need accelerated treatment. And this is because we know these people fracture early. So if you look at all the fractures that are going to happen in 10 years for someone with a broken humerus, half of them will have happened within two years and 80% within five years. So we have to act fast. And when you look at the studies, you can see when you measure the two-year risk of fracture, it's much higher than you'd anticipate just using FRACs. So we're going to put more people into the uh, treatment zone by using imminent fracture risk. And once they're in the treatment zone, we're going to put more people into the highest risk where they need specialist referral for anabolic therapy consideration. And to do this, there is an, uh, an add-on to FRAX Plus where it will look at recency of fracture, dose of steroids, but also falls, but individually. At the moment, they haven't been able to combine these risk factors. Another limitation is that you have to pay for this. So in the UK, this is generally not being used. But it's very important we do not ignore imminent fracture risk. When we look at a 1,000 women who've broken their arm that you may be seeing in your clinics, and you take into account the imminent risk of fracture, how long treatments work, and how strong they are, putting the imminent fracture risk means you add on 60% more fractures. And when you look at the effect on fracture reduction, it's disappointing. With alendronate, 82% of people who would fracture will still fracture. And it's only with the anabolics that we're getting close to 50%. And this is why it's so important to identify these patients for referral to secondary services. And we know the next fracture matters because if you do fracture again, you're much more likely to fracture at your hip. Almost a third of the refractures are at the hip. As you will know from your clinical practice, Having a hip fracture is a life-changing affair. While there is an increased risk of mortality, 80% of people live for more than a year and they never return to their quality of life that they had before their fracture. And this is important for patients because it helps them understand that they really need to take a recent fracture much more seriously as it will increase their risk of another fracture very quickly. Hi. So I've summarized why it matters, the FRACs and the strength and limitations. I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about a population of patients that you'll see, which are those with a recent fracture. We know that most of these patients are seen by orthopedic and rehab services and discharge to GPs. But we know, as I've already explained, that 
breaking a bone over 50 is one of the strongest predictors of osteoporosis and fracture loss. And many patients bypass bone health assessment, often because there's no one locally who can lead on it. And if they do this, if they don't have osteoporosis, it's fine. If they do have osteoporosis, it will just get worse and they'll have a devastating fracture in the future. So we want to change fragility fractures as not just something for uh, fracture, trauma, orthopedic and rehabilitation teams to recover from, but as a warning sign for osteoporosis. And we've instituted a fracture liaison service model that sees 80% of patients through identification, risk assessment, communications and monitoring. And there's lots more information you can find on the model's hospital system, but also by the Royal Osteoporosis Society. We have a national database of all the FLSs in the country with almost half a million results. And you can look at this data to look, uh, see if your hospital is participating, how well they do. You can use this freely accessible benchmarking table where you can look at your hospital and see how it's performing on these different metrics. And then within the hospital, you can look at changes over time. So I hope I've been able to share with you uh, why fracture risk matters, the importance of fracs, the strength and limitations. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you do have any questions, do email me and I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. So guys, I think I could see a couple of comments anyway. I think some of them we might be able to answer the next slides. Um, Luis, if you are okay to stop the presentation. And then I could see if I can share. I realized I didn't actually kind of mention um, Dr. Javed. He is actually a honorary consultant adult rheumatologist and associated professor in metabolic bone disease in University of Oxford. Um, he does lead the fracture layers and um, let me just read it better. <laughs> he specializes in common and rare metabolic bone diseases. He's the clinical lead for Oxford Fracture Prevention Service and the National Fraction Layers of Service Audit for England and Wales. And he co-chairs the Capture the Fracture program. He's the clinical lead for Oxford Rare Bone Disease Service for Adults and Musculoskeletal Genomic Clinical interpretation partnership. So his interest in research include epidemiology of musculoskeletal diseases with a focus on rare bone disorders, vitamin D, and secondary fracture prevention. So he's involved quite a lot with the fracture years and services well there. So just going to see if we can put in a few more slides. Some of them are a repetition of what Mr. Kasim has said, but it might just answer some of the questions as well. Yeah, everyone able to see the slides okay? I just realized I can't see anyone. Yes, we can, Nima. Yeah, yeah. Hear me, see? Okay, that's good. So I'm going to go blind now, so <laughs> I'll just keep going unless someone stops me there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a fracture risk assessment, um, the NICE guideline, it is from 2017. There is a new NICE guideline being developed, so things might change. Um, why is it not letting me present it? I don't know why. Okay, we'll just go as it is. Um, so it kind of recommends uh, the fr some kind of fracture risk assessment to be carried out for anyone over 65 females and men who are under 65 um, women under 65 women meant if uh, smoking, alcohol intake, etc. So secondary osteoporosis is a huge. Um, a range of conditions, um, and my slides are not working as they should. 
um, so endocrine problems could be hypogonadism, so any reason, um, hyperparathyroidism, so it's a huge list again, including diabetes, you're going through that. Um, you're also looking at the gastrointestinal ones, so celiac disease, uh, bowel syndrome, um, or you're kind of looking at any other reasons for malabsorptions. So it could be rheumatological in terms of rheumatoid arthritis or other inflammatory arthropathies or hematological, again, is almost like the whole system is involved in terms of the risk, um, second risk factors. Uh, could be respiratory in terms of COPD, cystic fibrosis, um, could be metabolic conditions or renal problems or even liver problems actually. But that's not in the guideline, but I'll come into it later, or other conditions or injuries. So they do ask not to routinely access fractures for people under 50, unless they have major risk factors. So this is people who might be using oral steroids, uh, either recent use, um, long-term use, or frequent use. Uh, it could be untreated uh, premature menopause or fragility fractures. So again, the next part is why do we need fractures? Why can't it just be a bone mineral density scan? Um, bone mineral density scan is not, not enough to predict the fracture risk. So we are kind of looking at a few reasons on that. Um, there are studies showing that majority of the fragility fractures occurs in people who don't have the osteoporotic BMD. So they might be osteopenic, uh, but not osteoporotic, but they are still having fractures. Uh, but also it emphasizes a lot more factors like the risk of falls and other things that we can look out for rather than just the mineral density. There. They also, it's also based on the fact that there are a lot of medicines can work for people uh, who are not on the osteoporotic range within the bone mineral density and it can aid effects. So from medication wise as well it is. So because from the NICE guideline, we don't have to have a BMD check. So you could have st a treatment started from a fracture risk assessment uh, without having a desk scan done. If I could move it there. Uh, so FRAXCO uh, is, is what Dr. Hassim actually mentioned about then as he mentioned that is a new factor as well on that. There are two uh, risk, uh, assessment scores that can be used, either FRAX or key factor. They both are recommended in NICE, so it's you know up to us to decide which one you want to use for your trust. The difference uh, with FRAX score is 40 to 90 years of age, while the key factor is 33 to 99 years. Um, it does incorporate far more health conditions, so really kind of talking about different health conditions and medications. It also talks about dose-dependent smoking. So Frasco just asks whether you're a smoker or not, um, current smoking, so it doesn't actually take into effect that someone who might have smoked for years and just stopped a month ago um, in their or their, how much they smoked and things. So these are actually being counted for in the key factor. Key factor is used um, for the uh, worldwide population, while the FRAX is actually being used for about 69 countries or more. Um, that is a usage fee. Uh, so that, again, that might be the reason why people don't go into the key factor. And um, it doesn't also allow the BMD scores. So when you have the DEXA scan results, there is nowhere to put them within the key factor. So FRAXCO was developed um, about eight, it took over eight years and launched in 2008. Um, it is a calculation tool. And I think um, Dr. Hazim actually showed how in terms of putting it through, I'm going to rush through this because we're just going to spend a bit of time. There's a sex in terms of male and female and it's for the biological Gen, um, the sex rate. Um, I think there is conversation going towards transgenders, uh, how that's going to form, but it's not actually in the plan yet. Um, in terms of transgenders, um, normally it's put in as a secondary. If someone is um, between their drop in sex change, so if their sex hormone levels are going down, and while they wait for the opposite genders kind of sex hormone levels to actually come up, um, that might be the period when they are at risk of bone health. So weight and height is in metrics, but again, the conversion is available on the same page as well if you have it in a different format. 
Um, when we are talking about the previous fracture, you're looking at adult low trauma fracture. Uh, so definitely kind of looking at the right ones there, but it doesn't um, come back to Q factor and the fracture pl uh, frac score plus. It doesn't really take into account that the vertebral low hip fractures are much more severe than a wrist fracture. So it is kind of looking at um, the fracture and as Ms. Javid actually mentioned, it doesn't talk about the recency of the fracture either, whether it happened quite recently, more risk of having another fracture. Pendral hip fracture is a yes and no question through that. Um, smoking, again, no, no dosage or if someone is an ex-smoker to kind of go from there. Glucocorticoids, um, I know it's recommended for 10 milligrams, uh, sorry, five milligrams and above for over three months, uh, but a lot of FRAC scores are left for the clinician's interpretation as well. So the FRAC score from 2.5 can be added if the person is at risk. Uh, and again, uh, the steroid use seems to be the older they are, the smaller dose seems to have more effect as well compared to a younger person might take heavy dose without having as much effect. So it seems to have a role as well. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis um, is one of the other questions that's there, but again, secondary sites in terms of medications, um, could be thinking about anticonvulsants or some of the antidepressants, uh, even like the diabetic one, thiazolamides. It could be the, you know, omisoprazole or lansoprazole in terms of the proton pump inhibitors uh, or HIV drugs. So again, it's kind of like a long list that can go under the secondary osteoporosis risk. The other part is the alcohol, three units or more a day, not talking about the chronicity. Everyone okay? Hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> I heard some noise, but I couldn't see anyone, so I'm kind of in there. Um, so again, a unit you're looking at the strength times the volume divided by 1,000, so it is a bit there, but you might be able to find, use this online calculator. Uh, which might be a best way to kind of quickly check um, if they are meeting the standards or not. Yeah. Uh, femoral neck, uh, again, the BMD is when it's available, but when it's available to actually put in the make of the DEXA scanning uh, equipment scanner rather than the T-score will give it much more accurate option as well. So I think I'm going to rush these ones out because I know Kasim just mentioned this in terms of that. So um, just if someone comes as low risk, the review is requested in about five years time unless the risk changes. So that's to kind of think about there. Um, intermediate level is uh, question whether they need a DEXA scan or not, but you can always treat without a DEXA scan results. So it's kind of understanding that as well. Um, even at higher risk, they might do a scan uh, to see if the effect of drugs, to see if the drugs are helping in two years time there. And so the fracture plus um, is what Kasim was talking about in terms of, you know, it is a paid, uh, you need to pay for this um, additional service, which actually talks about the other risk factors. And um, if you want to bypass the pay, paying, you might be able to use the regular one, but you might have to do some calculations to make it more accurate. Um, so, for example, if someone is taking about 7.5 milligrams of steroids, we need to increase their major osteoporotic fracture by 15% and their hip fracture by 20%. If someone has diabetes, you just have to click a yes to the rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it seems it has the same effect in terms of bones. Um, but if you, on the other hand, if they had rheumatoid arthritis as well as diabetes, um, then you add 10 years to their age to kind of come up with the numbers. Um, so there's quite a few of these like that. So if you are kind of interested in doing that, that is the, the NOG website is the best place to look. Uh, there's a table which talks about different adjustments that you can do in a FRAC score to make it much more accurate. And there. Um, in terms of the um, FRAX Plus, it includes the lumbar spine BMD, which is really good because people might have quite a difference in terms of the lumbar and the hip BMD. Um, it also looks into the number of folds in a year, hip axis length, because the longer the length is more likely, uh, more risk of fracturing, um, as well as the, the trabecular bone score from the DEXA uh, scoring as well. So it has more elements to it in terms of what can be used. 
So what we are going to do now is, I don't know which one to try, but we're just going to give you a few minutes to have a go with a FRAX score. So I have put it on the chat, the link for the FRAX score. It is the old one that I put, just because I think most people will be familiar with that. Um, just have a pretend go in terms of doing a FRAX score for someone. They need to be between 40 and 90 years old. Uh, but other than that, it's all up for you. So have a go for about five minutes and you know, just again, come up with questions. So it might just give you an idea of what happens once they had the score as well. So while you guys are doing, I'm going to pretend, oh, just again, making sure that we change it to Europe and UK <laughs> before we start, that we are on the right page there. Yeah. So once you've kind of done that, that, maybe go into where, you know, press the calculate so you could see in um, I might be teaching someone who's using it quite a lot. <laughs> Have a go. And uh, there. Uh, but the NOG items, one is your protic fracture, uh, but also there's a hip fracture line as well. Um, talking about weight management um, in terms of if they are underweight and stuff. So something to keep an eye out. And um, we can view the NOG guidance, which will go into the scoring there. I think, do I have to stop and come back? So again, just kind of like having a go and you could see the intervention threshold that's there to kind of say, so this is a NOG guideline. So it's UK, not UK, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Uh, Scotland uses sign, which is slightly different. So um, the scoring doesn't really apply for that, even though FRAX is still recommended. It's not kind of like in terms of the treatment thresholds, they are slightly different there. Um, but this might be a good one to kind of show it to your clients um, and then for them to decide if they are up for their treatment. So what the score is giving is the probability um, of them having a major osteoporotic fracture in the next 10 years. Um, so it is kind of understanding out of um, 100 people, someone with the same measure as the lady I put in, there will be like just under 20 of them will have a fracture. So it again, it just gives a bit more idea in terms of whether they are interested in carrying on further in terms of medication. Um, but also it gives a good one if you are sending it to the GPs um, in terms of sending them for a DEXA scan or getting them on the treatment without having to wait for a DEXA scan results through. Okay, I think oh, that might be it. I can't really think of that. something I thought about that I can't remember. On top of my head now, so I'll stop.
sharing and then go for it. Can you still hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, we're having a few connectivity can issues. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think we can hear you now, yeah. Oh. Okay, how much did you lose? <laughs> Just, just the last, but I think there are a few um, questions in the chat, Nima. Do you want to? Do you want me to read those out, or? Okay. Yeah, I could have a look. I think I can. Let me go from there. Um, Victoria. I think it just will work, but what you need to do is make sure you are in UK. Uh, the no guidance wouldn't come if you are from, if you have to see if that works. The old and the new fraction scoring is the same as the, is in a different, the old one is just the normal frax that we used. And then the new one, frax plus, um, has a page on it that's for the old score. So people don't have to look at two different places for that. However, the FRAX plus is the one that's changed to match different, you know, over the talks I was talking about, it kind of adds more questions about the number of folds um, in terms of linking it to the hip um, angle um, automatically. So you don't have to do any adjustments. Um, it is a paid service, so you do have to pay for that one uh, for FRAX plus while you don't have to pay for the frax. So it's kind of understanding that as well. Did I answer your question, Paul? Did you guys hear me or not hear me? We heard some of that, Nima. I'm just wondering whether it's worth us collecting the um, questions in the chat and catching up after this to try and answer them because it is a little bit difficult to. I was going to say maybe just type the answers. Sorry for the connectivity issues, everyone. If you've got any questions for Nima, if you're happy to pop them in the chat and we'll catch up with her after the webinar tonight to um, get them answered and um, try and get those out to you when we send out the email um, following the webinar, if that's okay. Can you can't we hear me can't properly. Hear you, Nima. Uh, sorry. Properly. I live in a kind of other people. So if everyone, yeah, if everyone's happy to pop any questions in the chat for Nima and we'll get those to her following um the the session tonight. Um and I hope we've covered most of the things Nima wanted to include there. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Um, we will send out um, a feedback form, um, which on completion will automatically send you a certificate of attendance. So if you'd be happy to fill that in, that would be great. Um, and as Nima's slide says there, if you've got any um, ideas for any future courses or webinars, there's an opportunity to pop that on the on the feedback form. Um, so yes, thank you very much everybody. And we'll we'll leave it there for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that.